Hey, Takeover Church, it's Pastor Matt McClure here, and thank you so much for checking out today's message. We pray it blesses you, we pray it encourages you, we pray it sets you up for a huge win this week. And before you go, make sure you subscribe below, make sure you're liking the channel, make sure you're sharing this with your friends to get the word out, not only about church, but all the incredible life-changing things that God is doing here at Takeover Church. We love you guys. Have a great rest of your week. Well, this morning... This morning, would you guys welcome our associate pastor? I got the morning off. This is why it's weird. I don't get to preach this morning. Instead, I get to receive and sit, and our associate pastor, Scott Fletcher, gets to bring the word. Come on, Scott A. Oh, man. Oh. Woo. So Scott is continuing while he gets set up. Scott is continuing our series, Lies from Below. Scott is a gifted communicator. He is a legend, and he's one of my best friends in the entire world. So give it up for Scott Fletcher one more time. Pastor Scott. Hey, guys. Good morning. Um, everybody doing all right? We got a lot of energy going, so I like that. Um, if this is your first time at TakeOver, Welcome. If you haven't uh, realized yet, we are a loud church. So up here today, I'm just going to preach it how I feel it. And you y'all better help me um, because, I mean, you've been helping everybody else. So you better help me too, all right? It's got a lot of energy going. Let's keep it up. All right. Um, everybody doing? Everybody feeling awake with the, the time change and everything? All right? Feeling good? I know that we woke up a little late this morning. Had an, uh, it might have been my fault. I might have hit my snooze button or something a few times. Um, but uh, my wife woke me up and hit me and said, hey, uh, it's like 7.30 right now and you're not up yet. So that's why my hair looks like this. Just, just kidding. It always looks like this. So. <clears throat> um, but yeah, super glad that you all are here. Uh, I love seeing everybody's faces from up here. It's an honor every time I get to preach. Um, for real, I just appreciate that, that I can be used in this capacity to, to bring a word. Uh, so this morning, like Matt said, we're, we're continuing the, the series, Lies from Below. All right, so we're pulling up lies. Matt's done a great job the first two weeks. Uh, we're pulling up lies from hell, and we're sending them right back down there where they belong uh, because they don't belong in our, in our spirits and in our minds. So the title, if you're taking notes, which you should be, um, the more notes you take, the faster you get to heaven is what I've heard. So it <laughs> might be some heresy there, but... Uh, if, uh, if you're taking notes, the title today, the lie that we are going to send back to hell is the lie of, I'm too far gone. Yeah, right, I'm too far gone. And I don't know if anybody in here has felt like they're too far gone. Uh, I know there have been moments in my life where I have felt that way, but that's what we're going to tackle today. Um, we're going to take that thought and we're just going to break it in half and, and we're going to get rid of it, all right? Uh, so today we're going to start, <clears throat> I'm going to read some scripture here to begin, okay? I'm um, coming out of Acts, and uh, it's focusing on this guy named Saul, all right? Um, this is after uh, Jesus has, has died and resurrected, okay? And uh, there's starting to be a movement of the, the way or the first followers of, of Jesus, the first Christians, okay? Um, but I'm going to read verses nine, or 3 through 9 and then 17 through 20. We're going to skip a little bit in the middle. Um, Acts, sorry, Acts 9. Acts 9, verse 3 is where we're going to start. Uh, it starts in verse 3, says, Now as he went on his way, this is talking about Saul, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling on the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Paul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. All right, pause. Like I said, we're going to skip ahead to verse 17, okay, for the sake of time here. Uh, but in between verses 9 and 17, um, the Jesus speaks to this guy named Ananias in a vision, one of his, his followers, and he tells him to, to go to Saul, all right? So we're going to pick back up in verse 17. It says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, 
has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples in Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God. I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into to break that down a little bit, okay? Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, another moment that we get to be gathered in your name, another, uh, another moment where we get to receive a word from you. Uh, I just pray that your spirit would be heavy in this place and, uh, and that you would just use my words to, to impact our hearts, God, and um, just let us feel your presence and uh, just let the rest of this service just glorify you always. And all God's people said, yeah. amen. All right. Okay, so back in the day, I know, and this is something where I do it a lot when I preach. You're just going to have to get used to it. Uh, I like to tell stories, and uh, that's just what it is. So back in the day, uh, my dad used to work for an awesome um, youth ministry organization called Youth for Christ. Um, it's kind of weird because there's actually, we got two guys in here whose dads used to and still do work for the same ministry in the same area, so that's pretty cool. Like, all of our dads have worked together, which is pretty cool. Um, side note, that means nothing to this story. But, uh, but anyways, so he, he worked for Youth for Christ for about 20 years. Um, so, or sorry, 25 years, actually. So my entire childhood, he was working for the same ministry in the same town in the same office building, for, like, my, my entire childhood. So... I had the opportunity to go to his office a lot and to hang out, and it was a pretty laid-back environment, so if there was ever a day where, uh, like, me and my brothers, we didn't have school, or, like, in the summertime when my mom was just, like, sick of the four of us trying to kill each other, then she would just take us out to his office and just, like, leave us there for a little bit and, like, let us hang out at his office, and uh, we loved it. It was cool. There was usually, like, other ministry guys around that would, like, mess around with us and hang out and do all this stuff, and it was a really cool place to be. But my favorite part about that office is it was like a shared office space, a kind of almost like a strip mall, but not really, just kind of like a little storefront thing. And there was like a back hallway that went back to this uh, back door of the bookstore that was connected to this, this whole little office space. And in this, this bookstore, it was a Christian bookstore, so they had like, obviously they have like Bibles and books and all that stuff. But I mean, I was a kid, so I wasn't interested in all that. I was interested in the 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 little toy section that they had there. Yeah, um, yeah they, they, had, they did have Bible Man gear, which was sick. We used to have a Bible Man outfit. It was cool. Um, yeah, don't judge me, all right? But, uh, but yeah, so they had, like, this whole big toy section that was just, like, when we were hanging out there, we were either found watching, like, a movie that you could rent there or we were found in this little toy section, all right? And, you know, they had... All, this, all these cool toys, like all the little wind-up stuff or like the cars and the planes and all that. Um, and and the, the lady that ran the actual bookstore, her name was, we called her Mrs. Pam. Um, she was a super nice lady. She let us play right on the floor in the bookstore because I think it's out of, out of business now, so it wasn't really that busy. Um, so she would just let us play right on the floor. So we just like, whatever we played with, as long as we put it back, we could just chill in this little space and then we could leave so we'd always go in there and play with the toys but my favorite toy that was in there was these little rubber snakes all right and they were so cool they were probably like this long and just like real stretchy rubber and they had a bunch of different colors there was like black ones and yellow and red but my favorite ones were these little green snakes and they came in these big tubs and there's probably like 500 in each tub but there's like a ton of these snakes like just everywhere so I just, I loved them. I thought they were the coolest thing. So the one time when, when I was about 10, we, we, we go visit my dad, and I think we, like, were doing some other stuff first and then hung out in the plane in the, in the little store area. And we hadn't been playing that long. And my dad, my dad came in, and he was like, hey, guys, I'm done with work. Like, it's time to leave. We got to clean up and get going. So then Scott has an, a little internal dilemma of, man, like, we just started playing with these snakes. Like, I got to put them back, and I got to leave. Like, this sucks. Like, I, just, I was just bummed out. Like, I had, these are my favorite toys. And 
in my dumb little 10-year-old brain, I thought, you know, I can play with these snakes here. I should be able to play with them at home, too. So even though I knew that it was stealing, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take some of these home, play with them here, play with them there, same, same. I'm just going to take them. <laughs> so my dad, like, turns around and leaves. My brothers leave. And I was like, yeah, I'm just cleaning up. And I just grabbed a handful of them. I shoved them in my pocket. And we left. And we went home. And I mean, OK, don't judge me. I was 10, all right? So everybody makes mistakes. Um, but yeah, so we get home. And I go up to my bedroom. And like, I'm playing with these snakes and stuff. And I, like, any chance that I got, I was like playing with them. And then whenever somebody was around or like I had to leave, I would just take them and I would shove them in the corner of my sock drawer and like cover them up, you know? You gotta hide the contraband. <laughs> Can't be caught with that stuff. So, so I'm like hiding these snakes and, and except the hiding spot that I picked was kind of dumb because as a 10 year old, I wasn't doing my own laundry. So like my mom is the one that does my laundry. So she comes in to put stuff in my drawer the one day and she finds them. And she asks me about it, she confronts me, and she just is like, hey, where did you get these snakes from? And I was like, I just made the problem way worse because I was like, well, Mrs. Pam just gave them to me and said that I could have them. And my mom as, is an adult, obviously, and has common sense, and I'm 10 years old and I can't, I'm just not a good liar, you know? So she sees through it, and it just, it, it was a really bad situation for 10-year-old Scott to be in, okay? So she doesn't believe me, um, but I stick to my guns. You know, like, I'm, I'm too far deep in this life of crime now. I can't just give myself up. I can't just, I can't just turn myself over, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm a hardened criminal at this point. So she gets my dad involved, which is never a good situation back, in, back during that time. So she gets my dad involved, and now these little snakes have created a, a barrier between me and my parents where I have this overwhelming sense of like guilt and shame that I betrayed Mrs. Pam like that because she was so nice to us, and I was just like feeling super guilty about it. And now I'm feeling like I can't come clean to my parents because I'm, like I said, I'm deep in this life of crime. I can't tell them what I'm doing. So I, I feel that separation from them. And... Uh, you know, I'm, but I'm just like, I'm determined I'm going to ride it out until my dad just straight up drops a bomb on me. And he's like, listen, I know that you stole these because I know that she's not just going to give them to you. So we're going to go back and we're going to go take these back to the bookstore. We're going to go see Mrs. Pam and you're going to give them back to her and you're going to apologize. And you're just going to hope that she doesn't call the police. And I was like, little 10 year old Scott just about passes out like, okay. I didn't realize the police were gonna, about to be involved here, which, I mean, oh nobody's going to call the police on a little 10-year-old for taking a little, couple of little snakes. But I didn't realize that at the time. So I was like, OK, this is, this is some serious stuff. So we go back, and, uh, and I go up to Mrs. Pam, and I'm just like so nervous. And I, I give her the snakes back, and I apologize. And I'm just like begging her. I was like, just please don't, please don't call the police. Like, please, please don't do this. Like, I didn't mean to. And like, all this, like, just giving her a sob story. And, uh, you know, she, she immediately forgives me. You know, she just takes the snakes and puts them back where they're supposed to be. But she, she forgives me right away. Um, doesn't call the police, you know. Ten-year-old Scott walks out, not in handcuffs, unscathed. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the story it worked out for my good. I left my life of crime in the past, and I didn't go back. Um, but it was a scary situation. And that story, it seems kind of like a stupid, funny little kid story. But as I was, like, thinking about that, I just thought of that feeling that I had of the separation from my parents where, like, I did something, and I couldn't, couldn't come back to them because of that. And... I had this feeling of shame and guilt, and, and I, I thought, like, if that's something that I was able to feel at 10 years old, and that's something that I've definitely felt uh, as an adult with, with my relationship with my Heavenly Father, where I do something and I feel separated, yeah. then how many other people on this planet have felt that same way? Right. How many people have felt separated from Jesus at, at some point in their life? Uh, because it's, it's, it's got to be everybody. Everybody has had to feel that way at some point. Um, 
like like the the more that I sin, the more that I mess up, the further away I get from him. And and in my mind, I just had this 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 vision of this this metal barrier. So like me and Jesus are here, and I and I sin and I mess up and I take a step back. And every time I take a step back and I mess up, the, this this steel barrier comes down. And then every time I step back again, another layer is added to that, and it gets thicker and thicker. And I get further away from him and further away from him. It's harder to get back to him. And I just I keep trying, but I can't do it. And it, it, it just it compounds on top of each other, and you start to get that feeling of, why am I even trying anymore? You know, this, I'm, I'm too far gone to get back to this point that I was at. I'm here. It's impossible to get back there. I'm too far gone. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to give up. I'm not even going to try to get back to that point anymore. You know, you get that feeling of, of like, I'm broken. You know, I'm not worthy. I've got too much, in, too much in my past. You know, I've had all these things happen. And I know, about, I know about Jesus. I know I've heard from my homies in West Michigan here. Like, I know about him. But I also know that he doesn't want this mess. I know that he can't be with sin. I know that he hates that, that I'm a mess like this. And it, it doesn't even matter. So I'm not going to try anymore. And I've had those thoughts. And I know that other people have had those thoughts too. And if you are continuing to have those thoughts, I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to rebuke those thoughts until the day that I die, because they're 100% a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie from Satan that too many people have felt, and it, it needs to go. It, it's, it, it's not healthy to, to think that way, because just like the, the scripture that I read, if Jesus can take someone like Saul and turn him into someone like Paul, he can do that with every single person on this planet. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You know, in, in the scripture that I just read, um, it's talking about Paul and, you know, or uh, about Saul, sorry. And maybe you do know him better as Paul. Like Matt was up here talking about Paul just during his, his offering message. Maybe you know him better as Paul because um, that's who he becomes after this insane encounter. But Saul before this is, he's, he's, a, he's a stone cold killer, all right? He's not just a killer, he's a persecutor and a destroyer of the first Christians, the followers of the way, the people that are believing in Jesus just shortly after Jesus has, has resurrected, all right? And, you know, he, he's referenced so many times in Scripture as to being a, a direct enemy of Jesus and his followers. In, in Acts, uh, you know, the Scripture, is, it talks about this guy named Stephen, who he was an outspoken follower of Jesus, and in chapter 8 in Acts, so a little bit before the, the scripture that I just read, in verse 1 it says, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. So Saul approves of the execution of Stephen, and it sets off this huge persecution of the church all throughout Jerusalem. And then in verse 3 it says, But Paul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. So these are all people that are, all they're doing is proclaiming the name of Jesus, and Saul is, is going after him, all right? So he, he is legitimately an enemy of Jesus and Jesus' people at this point in time. You know, in, in, in every sense of the word, he is directly against them. But after this, this, this radical encounter... Like, so th th this, this crazy thing happens. He, he sees this light. It blinds him for three days, right? Then this guy, Ananias, comes. Just Ananias didn't really want to come. That's in that scripture that we skipped over. Um, but he doesn't really want to come because he knows who Saul is. But he listens to Jesus anyways. And he goes and he lays hands on him and he, he heals him. He's got the, the scales that fall off his eyeballs, which is always kind of gross to me. But he... He lays hands on Saul and he heals him and, he, and he, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, the, the scales fall off, he's healed, he's made strong, he's baptized. And then in that, in that scripture, in verse 20, it says, And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. You know, this, this broken man, Saul, is transformed into Paul, and Paul is just on a mission from the get. Like, he is a totally new person, 
nothing like Saul at this point. And, and Paul is considered the guy that is pretty much responsible for church as we know it today. And he's responsible for, considered to be responsible for like half of the New Testament. That's the same guy that was killing and persecuting the same people that in those scriptures he would later be trying to help out. He would later be spurring on to do better. That's the same guy. He killed people for proclaiming the name of Jesus, for saying he was the son of God. And then he has this radical transformation, and that's the first thing he does. He immediately proclaims that Jesus is the son of God. Now, thinking about that, think about all those things that he did as Paul that could have never been if he would have lived out of that place of I'm too far gone, of having that thought in his head of I'm too far gone for Jesus to use me, all those things that he did to, to further the kingdom of Jesus could have never happened through him if he was still living in that place of feeling like, I can't do this because of all this stuff that I've done in the past. I killed these people. I persecuted them. And now I'm supposed to, to go this way and, and, and lead them? And, and how am I supposed to do that? If he lived from that place, some of these things would have never happened. But it's, it's the fact that, that he was quote-unquote, too far gone, that Jesus was able to use him. It was the fact that, that he had this story, that he had this past, that Jesus was able to use him. Those are the reasons that God was able to, to move through him because it made Paul realize that Paul on his own isn't enough, that he has to give God all of the glory, right? Because, you know, he, he recognizes that on his own strength, none of this is possible. He knows that who he knows who he is without Jesus. He's Saul. He's this terrible dude. With with Jesus, he's Paul. He's this guy that is capable of doing all these amazing things for the kingdom of Jesus. And Paul even says later in, in Ephesians 3 8, he says, Though I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, he, he, rec he, he recognizes it. He says, though I am the least of these, I've been given this grace. And that's the thing, like, only through the grace of God are we made able. That's, that's the, the, the biggest thing that I can say is only through the grace of God are we made able. We can do nothing of value without Jesus controlling our lives that way. Um. And, and, you know, when, when we are in that place of perceived separation from Jesus, and, I, and I, say, I say perceived because Jesus is always coming after us. We are the ones that perceive that separation in our minds. But when we're in that place of perceived separation, like, like I said, the, the whole vision that I have of this steel wall that just keeps building and building and getting thicker, and, 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 and I sin again, and another big sheet of steel comes down, and it's here, and I'm, and I'm banging on it, and I'm pounding on it, and I can't get back through it. And I'm trying, and I'm trying, but I mess up again, and I step back, and another one comes through. And it's just, it's so impossible, and I'm just beating on it, and I'm trying to get it, and, and no matter how hard I try, I can't get through. And really, the whole time that I'm pounding on this wall, the only thing that I ever had to do was just surrender. All I have to do is just say, Jesus, I, I can't do this without you. I can't get back through to you. I need your help in this moment. And, and I'm a nerd, okay, so, so deal with it. But the vision that I have in this scenario with this big steel barrier is I finally, I just finally give up and surrender. And Jesus is on the other side. And, you know, when I finally just say, God, Jesus, I need you to help me with this. I need you to do this for me. I just see him on the other side, and he pulls out a, a lightsaber, right? <laughs> and just, boom, just turns it on, okay? Yeah, biblical. That's biblical. But he whips out his lightsaber, right? Because why wouldn't Jesus have a lightsaber? He's got to have one. He's got to have one. All right? You know he does. But he whips out this lightsaber and just sticks it into the barrier, and just, it just melts this barrier like butter. So he's... he's cutting through, melting the barrier like butter, and he cuts out this, this Scott-shaped, sized hole in this barrier 
and he just pulls me right back through to him. That's, that's the vision that I have there. And if you're not a Star Wars fan, I mean, you can say he's using a blowtorch or something. It's just, it's just not as cool. It's kind of lame. So, but, oh, he definitely had the blue, like the blue, light blue light. Yeah, for sure. Um, I guess he could have purple, though. Yeah, he, per, royalty, yeah. He could be, it could be purple. Um, but no, all, all jokes aside, though, for real, like, that is the power of, of Jesus. Like, that is the power that he possesses, you know? No matter, no, no matter what we've done, no matter what barriers we've built up there, you know, he will use that for his glory. You know, he's going to use it to glorify him. And... You know, that, that lie uh, from hell that tells us that we're too far gone, you know, that, that is a thing of the past simply by speaking Jesus' name over it, yeah. over our lives. Simply by speaking Jesus' name over our lives, yeah. that lie has to go. It, it can't stay. And, you know, Pastor Matt just spoke uh, at our team night on Wednesday, and he spoke about the power of the tongue and, and speaking life and death over over the situations in our lives and, and just uh, and, and what we speak and the power that is possessed there. And when we choose to speak the name of Jesus over our lives, things must change. Things have to change simply by speaking his name over our lives. And, and I think right now, as a church, we need to catch that revelation, like just get in our spirits that that is the power that Jesus' name possesses. Um, you know, if we can catch that, like the, if I choose to keep speaking that narrative over my life of I'm too far gone, which, by the way, that narrative of I'm too far gone is the biggest form of pride that I've ever seen. And it's an insult to our God. Because if I'm sitting here saying I'm too far gone for Jesus to save, that's saying that the things that I've done as a human in my human life, in this human realm, are too much for Jesus to come get me out of that. Yeah, that's and that's, that's straight up pride. That is thinking so much of my own life and my own situations and the, the things that I've done. That's, that's prideful on the highest level, thinking that Jesus can't come back and save me out of something there. So but if, if, if I live in that same narrative of I'm too far gone, if I keep speaking that over myself, I'm just going to keep living that over and over and over again. And nothing is going to change. But it, instead of that, if I change the narrative and I speak the name of Jesus over my life, then that turns from I'm too far gone into a story of redemption. That turns into a story of me being redeemed and made holy and made right in Jesus' eyes and being made, turned back to Jesus' friend. Just that, that's, that's the power that his name possesses. When I speak his name over my life, that is the impact that it can have. Um, uh, worship team, you guys can probably start to make your way up here. Um, I got a little bit left, uh, but you guys can make your way back up. And I, and I want to read one last piece of scripture, um, just so, so y'all can catch the importance of, of speaking his powerful name over our, over our lives, okay? Um, in the, in the Old Testament, the Lord brings, uh, the prophet Ezekiel to a valley that is filled with dried bones, Okay? And the Lord, he, he speaks to Ezekiel, and this, this whole passage is from Ezekiel's perspective here, okay? In Ezekiel 37, 4 through 10, Ezekiel says, Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews, or tendons, upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, 
and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. That is the power of the name of our God. That a, a human can speak his name over dry bones and they come back together and there's life breathed back into them and it, it creates living, breathing people to mass an exceedingly great army. So if that is possible through his name, then what would happen if we spoke his name over our lives? You know, what, what generational curse could be broken? You know, what lies that we've been believing can be broken? What past could be erased? You know, through Jesus, the impossible is, is made possible through his name. You now, he takes the things in our lives that are dead and completely broken, and he breathes new life into them and makes them new. And if, if I'm being totally transparent, I, I preach a lot about redemption stories because that's, that's my story. That's, that's what I know. I relate to this story of Saul to Paul a lot um, because I, I've been there in my life. I had, I had a time in my life where I, I had a, a bottle of whiskey under my bed at all times. And, and I was, my life was headed in, in like a total nosedive tailspin about to just crash and blow up. And, and that's why I'm passionate about it because if, if the Lord can take someone like me that was just in complete self-destruct mode and turn me 180 degrees in the opposite direction and, and, and give me a, a, a platform like this to speak from and put me in this, this family that I call Takeover Church, you know, it's, he's using my shortcomings for his glory. And if he can do that for me, he can do that for you. He can do that for anyone. The same as, as he takes Saul to Paul, the same he's done for me, the same he does for all of us. And I recently, I recently heard a song with, with the lyrics. I mean, shout out to, to Corey Asbury. Um, but I heard this song that says, My failure won't define me because that's what my father does. My failure won't define me because that's what my father does. So I don't know what that looks like in your life, what failure has been defining you and what you need to give up and let, let the father define in you. But as we go back into this, this moment of worship, I just want you to consider what areas of your life need to have Jesus' name spoken back over them. What areas of your life you need to let Jesus define or redefine. You know, uh, if you've been living in that mindset of, of I'm too far gone, that ends in this moment. You know, there, if there's something that you have been living with from your past that you just feel like you can't shake, that ends in this moment. You shake it off in Jesus' name. You know, give it up to him. Ask someone next to you to speak life over you, to speak Jesus' name over you, to speak his name over your current situation. If you, if you, need, if you feel like you need a, a leader of the church to do that for you, Zach's going to be in the back, and he would love to just pray over any specific situation you have going on. He'll, he'll speak Jesus' name over you. He'll give you that fresh anointing. But what, whatever it is, don't leave this moment stuck in that valley of dry bones. Get that fresh, God-breathed air back in your lungs before you leave. Okay, this is, this is your moment, all right? Don't, don't leave this moment still hanging on to that stuff in the past and, and with that mindset of I'm too far gone because you're not. As soon as you give up and you, and you just say, God, I surrender, that, that feeling of separation, it, it's gone. I don't care if it's, if it's something that you stole when you were 10 years old or if it's something that you did last night. It has to go, that shame and guilt has to go when you speak Jesus' name over it. So don't, don't leave this moment without that surrender to him. All right, thanks guys. Take it away, Rusty.